and the presentation today is What is the Future of Specifications? It's presented by James M. Robertson, Robert S. Wygant, Mark Kalin, and Lewis Medcalf. James M. Robertson, FAIA, FCSI, CCS, is president of Robertson Sherwood Architects in Eugene, Oregon. He has been actively involved with developing and improving CSI formats and the manual of practice since 1984. He has served on numerous CSI technical related committees and task teams, and in addition to a term as Institute Director from the Northwest Region and Institute Vice President. Most recently, he chaired the Institute's Information Management Coordination Task Team. For the past three years, he has been CSI's delegate to the International Construction Information Society. Robert Wygant is a BIM integration consultant and content developer from Dover, New Hampshire. He is co-chair of the CSI BIM practice group, a member of the Institute Technical Committee, and president of the New Hampshire chapter. Robert is the author of BIM content development standards, strategies, and best practices, as well as co-author of the construction, specification, writing, principles, and procedures both published by John Wiley and Sons. Committed to furthering the role of the specifier in BIM-based projects, Robert is working on tools and techniques which will allow the role to become a critical aspect of future project delivery methods. Mark Kalin is president of Kalin Associates, an independent specification consulting firm in the Boston area. He is a registered architect, CSI certified construction specifier, a lead accredited professional, and a fellow in both the AIA and CSI. Mark Kalin is president of specification consultants in independent practice and past president of CSI Boston. He has been chairman of the AIA Master Spec Review Committee and is currently chair of CSI's National Technical Committee and co-chair of CSI Sustainability Practice Group. Lastly, Lewis Metcalf, FCSI CCS, is senior quality manager at Gresham Smith and Partners a multidiscipline, multi-office firm with headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. Lewis co-hosts the Specifying Practice Group with David Stutzman and is chairing a task team that is preparing a guide document for multiple work packages. Please welcome James, Mark, Robert, and Lewis. Good afternoon. Uh, we are really uh, uh, glad that you're here with us this afternoon to uh, um, be with us for our exploration of the future of specifications. Um, this session is uh, really a promo, if you will, for the CSI practice groups. Um, and we're going to address that subject of what is the future of specifications from the um, perspective of those, uh, at least three of the, the current practice groups. Uh, Mark Wygant, co-leader of the BIM practice group. Uh, Mark Kalin, co-leader of the sustainability practice group. And Lewis Medcalf, who is co-leader of the uh, specifying practice group. In the next 60 minutes or so, uh, we hope to entice you to become involved in one of the CSI practice groups. Um, and we hope to do that through this discussion of this subject from those three points of view. Bob addressing how specifications will change in this new world of building information modeling. Uh, Mark will talk to us about the specifications related to sustainability and how to uh, go about those practices. And finally, Lewis is going to let us all know, those of us that are involved with specifying, if we have any future at all. And hopefully we do. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to, from a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with CSI's practice groups? If you'd raise your hand. Okay. How many of you actually have participated in one or more of those? A few less. So I assume the others of you uh, really don't know much about the practice groups. The Practice groups were initiated about two and a half years ago by the technical committee as a means of trying to get members involved with sharing information and best practices. 
Uh, they involve uh, monthly one-hour webinar sessions, and they're organized by our volunteer leaders. And those leaders initially were came out of the technical committee, but the hope is as these practice groups get, get established and um, uh, we get a, some other gray hair involved that we'll be able to uh, get others involved in a leadership role. And it really takes more than one person, and you'll see most of these have co-leaders, and we're hoping that other people will get involved in the future. Um, they're open to anybody. You don't have to be a member of CSI to participate. Um, the purpose is to really share knowledge, best practices, talk about current events, uh, current trends, uh, to share uh, amongst those that are willing to share. Uh, typically, they begin with some presentation uh, about a topic. Usually, those topics are suggested or recommended by one of the participants. Uh, the leader and the leaders are involved with organizing that and identifying people to make those presentations. And the pre presentations are not an end at all. They're actually a way to stimulate discussion and get people to talk about the subject. Um, they're free. It doesn't cost you anything money-wise to participate. It does involve your time. Well, 60 minutes isn't a lot of time. Um, we also hope that uh, you will invest in those practice groups by actually contributing some of your expertise and knowledge so that you can help somebody else that might not have the same background and experience that you do. So at this point, what I'd like to do is to find out from the three presenters, main presenters that we have today, what really is the future of the specifications. I'm Bob. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm Robert Wygant, the co-chair of the uh, BIM practice group. And you know, we, we do our monthly meetings. We're actually getting ready to look at actually taking a new format. And rather than having a, a single or two co-leaders, we're thinking about moving to a panel format. And that would allow multiple individuals to weigh in on the topics. In a lot of cases, these webinars Require that um, require that the, uh, the the attendees actually be muted because there's so many of them. So if we can get more people involved, um, you can get some different perspectives uh, based on the different topics that are being talked about. The reason I, the reason I bring that up is because we're always looking for for individuals that are interested in getting involved with uh, leadership of the practice group. So if anybody's interested. Uh, you can see me or, or um, anybody from CSI that can point you in the right direction. Um, but you know, on to uh, the future of specs. Um, you know, BIM is a new technology. It's an emerging, well, let's not call it a technology, it's an evolution. Um, it's, it's a technology the same way that architecture is a technology. It's, it's constantly in motion, it's constantly changing, um, and there's new tools, there's new techniques, there's new methods that are used. Uh, with respect to with respect to the connection between BIM and specifications, uh, really all it is is just a new way of, of looking at the documentation. Um, you know, if you think about specifications in the last hundred years, you know it may have gone starting from handwritten documents, and with the advent of the typewriter, it becomes uh, much easier and much more quick to to create a specification than word processing. Uh, makes it even easier to revise. From there, uh, a series of spec wizard type tools have been generated that allow uh, documents to be created, created on the fly using you know, editing tools so that it minimizes the amount of effort to, uh, to create those documents. Now, BIM is opening the door for uh, some substantial changes where you're, you're actually not generating the document as much as you are manipulating the information. Um, the, the, doc, the information that, that can potentially be held inside the model can be used to create a specification. Now, I'm not saying that a specification is going to be, is going to be completely generated by a model overnight, and it may never happen. Uh, but the information in that model definitely creates a head start for any specifier who's out there who's trying to put together a document. Um, when, it, when an architect puts a project together and they add real-world products with real-world uh, attributes in it, 
that information can be exported from that model and used for, uh, for not only analysis, but to create specification documents. Um, you're not going to have every single component in that model, not at this point in the game, because there's a lot of non-graphic information that resides in specifications that will likely never be involved in a bit. Things like um, concrete resurfacing, uh, you know, metal finishing. These are things that you can't really convey graphically, but nevertheless still require a specification. Now, that's not to say that there's not ways to put that information into the model. The real question is, is it, is it, the, relevant, is it the right place to put it? Um, yes, you could, and I've actually come up with some little methods, what, what I call the spec attic. And that's taking a little tiny piece of graphics and embedding that in the model. And within those graphics, it actually houses all the information about, say, part one of a spec or concrete resurfacing. So that you could theoretically put that in there. But really, the question comes up is, is that the right way to do it? Um, BIM is a relational database. And what that means is that it's a series of tables that are associated with, with other uh, either reports or output documents or other tables. So that these, uh, these pieces of information are housed inside of this model and can be analyzed. They can be changed, they can be manipulated, and they can be deleted. So that you can see everything that's in a project, not just based on what it looks like, but based on what it is. And this creates that connection between the specification information and the graphics themselves. So you have this single point that you can work from. Um, as the technology advances, we may see more components in, inside of these models where Today, it may not be practical for an architect to put every single fire extinguisher cabinet in a project, or every single light switch, or every single receptacle. So rather than, rather than trying to model down to the end, there, there has to be an assumption that there is going to be information that's not in the model that still requires a specification. And this is where, where you, you just can't replace a specifier. Now, what, what I see as happening is the role of the spec writer is, is becoming diminished, but the role of the specifier is, is <coughs> coming to the forefront. Um, now, there's a big difference between the two. Um, you know, a, a spec writer can tell you what's in a project, and a specifier can tell you why it's there. And that's the difference between, that's the, difference between the two that, that is very relevant going into the future. Because uh, right now, as it, as it stands today, the individuals that are working on, on CAT, on BIM projects, have very little knowledge, very little working knowledge, if any, on products, assemblies, and systems that are going into these projects. So they need to know what they're doing. And they need somewhere, somewhere to get that information. And by leveraging the practice groups, they can get that information. And by uh, taking a young reviteer, and partnering them with a season specifier, you can you can come to that middle ground, and 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 create what I'm you know sort of coining as the knowledge manager, which is an individual who can see the information in a project through, from concept all the way through turnkey. So you have this full life cycle of information that that can be used throughout throughout the entire life of the building. So. From, from the start, you have an individual who, uh, who walks in and sets a, st a, 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 a series of standards for the project. And as, as the, the design gets fleshed out, they add more information into the project. And as, as the design is completed, they create the documentation, the project manual. And as the, as the project's being constructed, they shift gears into an administrative role where they're watching what's happening as far as change orders, as far as you know, actual products that are going into the project, and be able to make those changes to that model so that by the time the project is completed, you have a true as-built. And that as-built is, it can be a tremendous asset to an owner in being able to manage their facility. So, you know, the information, you know, 
when you look at the future of, of specifications, um, you have to look at it not just as a document, but as a, as a series of informational pieces that are all put together. So rather than having this document that's about this tall <laughs> and a, a lot of paper, you have information that's stored in a database as the project's growing. So you, that allows people to do uh, what I call active specifying. So you can create a standard for your windows or doors, for instance. And you say that it needs to have an STC of this, and it needs to be made of oak, and it needs to have an R value of this. And from there, you can actually drag in three manufacturers and look at their attributes, apples to apples, and say manufacturer A meets my criteria, manufacturer B does not, and manufacturer C does. So you can look at, at you can throw out B, look at A and C, and make, make determinations of what the right project product is for the project based on the attributes that were set forth. It, it minimizes the effort necessary to do that. I mean, you can do that today by by sifting through data sheets, but when you can when you can nearly automate the process by by leveraging building information modeling, it it certainly it certainly is an asset and a, and a, a benefit to the architect. Um, so, right now, the way that most BIM projects are being developed is mainly on a graphics level. There's not a lot of information that's being put into the projects, and I have to believe that a lot of it is due to architects not being paid to do it. And they're, they're, just, they're just saying, well, it's really not a benefit to me. I'm already paying a specifier to write spec, so you know, why do I need to give them a head start? Um, they can just write a spec based on, on what they know and, and call it good. Um, if you, if you start adding that information, you can, you can make assumptions about additional products that are adjacent to each other. So if you have a door that's in a given location, or a window in a given location, you know it's a casement window, and you know it needs to swing a certain direction, you know you need certain clearances. And when you can see that, and when you can analyze that in a model, uh, it, makes a, it, makes, it adds a tremendous benefit to the entire, the entire community. Um, so it's looking at, projects in more of an integrated project delivery method, where everybody's working on the same team here. Let's try to help each other out. Uh, if, I can, if, if my efforts can assist the contractor, uh, they're ultimately going to assist the owner. So you know, let's, let's help the owner out by, by adding that information in. And you know, going back to the, the concept of the knowledge manager, the, the knowledge manager can sort of oversee all of this. So if you think about what a knowledge manager is, is doing, they're working with the owner, they're working with the architect, and they're working with a con the contractor. So it, it would seem reasonable that this individual, rather than being a function of the architect or the design team, is more a function of the owner, uh, something like a, a, a CMA, construction manager's advisor, uh, who's coming in early and staying late to oversee everything that's happening. Um, this, this gives them a vested interest in making sure that the information is correct, not, not at the end of the design, but at the end of the project and, and through into, into life cycle. Um, and that gives a lot more information to the owner and allows them to, to use it for facilities management. Um, so, I mean, as we roll into the future with all of this, a lot of it is just thinking about you know, what, what can I do as a specifier, or what can I do as an architect, or what can I do as a contractor to further the development and streamline the process of the project, not just streamlining the construction, or streamlining the design, or streamlining uh, the specification. Uh, it's, let's make everybody's job easier. Um, and it, because if, if the specifiers do it, and the architects do it, and the contractors do it, Everybody's helping out a little bit more and putting in a little bit more effort, and everybody's getting a little bit more out of it. So, um, from from a specifications perspective, specifiers are not going to go away. If anything, they're going to become more valuable to the project in their ability to to um, to add add product knowledge to the project and add. Uh, 
a level of expertise that nobody else has on the team. Right now, architects leverage the expertise of specifiers every day. They don't know which carpet they need to use. And they, they just know what it looks like. And they're not going to be able to tell you the difference between the weights of carpets because they don't care. It's not their, it's really not their, their, that's not their wheelhouse. Their wheelhouse is in the design. The specifier is the one that does this. So um, as we roll into, into BIM, it's only natural that they, they keep going with it, you know, ease back on the documentation side, and push forward with the product information that they've gained over the last 30, 40, 50 years. So um, you know, with that, uh, I think I want to turn it over to you know, probably one of the most knowledgeable product, product experts that we have. So Mark? <laughs> well, I know Mark best, so I know he knows lots of people. Thanks, Bob. Um, so how many people get that, that phone call? I meant to call you earlier. <laughs> I need the spec at noon, fax it over. <laughs> You're going to get the best one hour spec you ever saw. So uh, we're going to switch to a, a PowerPoint here uh, while Jim does that. How many people have volunteered more than 1,000 hours for CSI? <laughs> okay, so I'm among friends. Um, the future of specs and sustainability. Let's see how this works. You know, this we talk about sustainability, save the planet. We're really talking about saving water, saving energy. But I'm not in charge of that spec. I don't think you're in charge of that spec either. Uh, nature's in charge. There have been six mass extinctions since the planet began, and uh, we have to be careful we don't become the next. But this is what we have to do. This is what you and I have to do. We've got five million people on this planet moving <coughs> to cities every month. We need, we're supposed to be really busy right now, except for that financial thing. We're supposed to be really, really busy. And you're the people who have to figure this out. And, and as spec writers, there's not enough of us. So we have to move forward. You've seen this one. You know, you have to get it right during design. Fell over so slowly that the uh, windows didn't break. I have a, a friend who's a masonry repairman. A masonry, he can fix these pat, you know, these cracks. And the windows, you don't need laminated glass in China, so you could probably still move in to the flush, I guess. <laughs> you know, if they forgot the steel on the foundations. That's what it was. Um, anybody know what this is? Uh, dam it's, it's a dam intake. It's a real dam intake. You know, <laughs> if, if you're the farmer down in the valley, you're really happy that the water doesn't come over the end of the dam. If you're in a kayak, <laughs> this is a whole different thing. You know? The people who say, I've got a 100% recyclable roofing product, 100% recycled content, it's paper mache, but you know, so it's warranted till the first time it rains. You know, it's all about what's your perspective. If you're in Siberia, 300 million acres, you can now farm and feed all the people in that part of the world. But the carbon dioxide that's coming out, um, you know, may, we don't know exactly what the consequences are. So we come to the world of BIM, the terrifying world of BIM, the thing that's supposed to scare us all. And the one thing I want to say in the next 10 minutes is that nobody in this room should be the least bit scared about BIM because you know more than they do I'm just going to explain it to you in 10 minutes. You probably already know. Where are you on this track? Are you in conceptual design? Are you in detail design? Are you in analysis, documentation, fabrication, operation and maintenance? And I'll send this PowerPoint to anybody who wants it. Because there's somebody who's coming after you. And ultimately, it's the owners who pay uh, year by year for what goes on. And we have to do buildings that do better. We have to do documentations that fit in. You know, so you can put something in a BIM model, you could look for all the walls if you want, don't know why. There's data there. That's the scary part. That's the data. That's where they're going to need us as specifiers. Um, IFC models, uh, something that looks like a spec, green format. Um, all these pieces and parts live in a model and everybody gets to, gets to look at it. So, but can we just say what's a spec? Because someone will come to me and say, Mark, I need, I want to use Mars Climate Plus ceiling. Um, and then the hand phone goes dead or, or whatever. There's some nice sustainability attributes here, uh, recycled content, here's a picture, here's another picture. As a spec writer, I have to go, would you please turn to page two? Because there are three edge types. 
there's seven sizes, there's seven grids, and they don't all go together, right? So I guess I just become the designer of the building because I picked those because they didn't. And then we argue what's the difference between what I thought and what they didn't tell me. But the point is, there is a lot of information here. You know, uh, the light reflectance, the uh, recycle content, all those sustainability attributes. And here that is in a three-part spec. These are the exact same words on that. On that. And okay, so it's, uh, it's just in a, a format that I understand a little bit better than the marketing format. Maybe there's part, you know, the part three of that section where you put in some things that you need, like the, what's the tolerance for putting in that ceiling and, and the things that you know need to be in a spec that aren't product related. And here's what it looks like in a BIM model. These are all the same words. These are exactly the same words. If you can do an outline spec, you can be a master BIM spec whatever. Um, because what is it that people are looking for? Now the manufacturers care an awful lot about these properties because that's what sets them apart from their competition. That's what uh, it, their stuff is tested to. But here are three manufacturers with their name and with their model number and with their grid number. And yeah, you could stop there. Maybe on federal work you have to start here and, and not have that. So however you're going to use to communicate things in a BIM model, in an outline spec, in product literature, it's really not that different. Um, so I got a finish schedule from a BIM model because this was the, uh, a project that, um, this was their idea of the spec. You know, rubber base, one, two, three, paint, one, two, three, ceiling, one, two, three, wall, one, two, three. Um, and uh, so what did I do with that? You know, it came out of the BIM model. Am I going to go back into the BIM model and change it? No, as a spec writer, I'm just going to mark it up, and then I'm going to give it back to them because they don't want me touching their model, although we could. We can, we can put information in uh, non-graphically. We can preload information into the model. If, if you start with an outline spec and that reflects real products, all that data can be put into the model without any graphics. That's what all those building product manufacturers upstairs are doing, it, spending tens of thousands of dollars to communicate to us as designers and specifiers so that other people down the stream can look at the model. I had a call yesterday from a contractor who said, well, it's, you have 8,000 square feet of windows on your, on your job. And, uh, then the, and then the architect said, well, and there's type one, two, and three in the contractor. What do you mean type one, two, and three? You know, it, 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 what the price he had just developed was useless. Because something as simple as there were three types of windows, no one took the time to put it in. So you do have to pay attention to what comes later. So how do you know? These are some slides that um, Bob gave me. Um, you want to create a schedule. You know how to do an access database. All you really do is you you have a schedule. You decide what the schedule is. You've got you print out your schedule. If you put this in there, you know you could order your windows here if you wanted to. If you put that much in there. But right now, we're at a very bumpy time where everybody's trying to figure out the value proposition. Do you think that the uh, window uh, subcontractor would like to get a whole list of the windows and the sizes? Absolutely. The architects who are afraid to um, do, uh, gee, I don't know how many doors exactly, 180, but better to have uh, um, some, one sub guest 150, one sub guest 250, because they've only got an hour to take it off. Better to be off by one or two doors than than there. Harold Walford at another conference said that architectural fees in the United States are $20 billion. Estimators' fees, including the subcontractors and their subcontractors and their are $30 billion. They want us to count. How simple. Why should we care? Because they're downstream. So here's a UFGS spec, sort of fresh out of the box. And here is uh, some middles, and maybe this is how it's influenced by sustainability. I know you can't read this. It says recycled content documentation, regional material documentation, NFPA 285 fire door inspection report, and the COBE documentation, construction operations building information exchange, the spreadsheets that the owner needs to run the building. And here's part two of that spec. So I call this a BIM spec. What's going on right now with the specifiers property sets and the CSI National Technical Committee is we're going from, from 60 to 1,200 to 6,900 groups of nouns. Think of them as outline specs. I don't care what the values are here. Actually, I do care. But if you've got a, um, you know, 
You've got an interior door. Is, is the thickness one and three quarters or something else? Is the fire standard an FPA 252 or UL 10C? Um, these are things that we can do research on and make sense of. This is what a BIM spec looks. So maybe this information is in the model. Maybe this information is in the spec. Maybe this information in the, in, is in the cost estimate. And maybe this is in the submittals because the contractor could self-certify that they they, uh, they met all these things. So you can get sustainability, you can get information throughout this whole process. To me, sustainability is about performance. It's not about just recycled content and regional materials. We, Our firm has done 192 lead projects. I can tell you that you do not need recycled content or regional materials in any finished material to get lead platinum. It's, so, you know, performance. The quality of the manufacturer, the durability of the project. Now, if you want to separate green and lead, that's fine. And but what's driving your spec? Today we see design assist subcontractors, subcontractors coming up into the model, coming up into the firm to help. Construction manager collaboration. Collaboration is a polite word. Um, lead certification being the need to make things work. Made in USA, American Recovery Act. We've got so many demands on our specs. Kobe documentation, these property sets, which, um, you know, right now they're, it's been up for two years on the whole building design guide and the, uh, the, the NIP site. So why does it all work? Because CSI has formats. We have master format, we have the uniform format, we have green format, we have omniclass, we have our page and section formats. None of this works in BIM without CSI. You, CSI provides and maintains, actually you, because we're all volunteers, make sure all of this happen. And the National CAD standard, which CSI supports, 5,000 firms, um, you know, following a, a drawing order. So there are plenty of green label products. Um, FSC floor score, my favorite is the frog parking only. All others will be towed. Um, and, I, and I point that out because no one ever sees that. It's so bewildering to, to see all these green label products. And USGBC leads out there right now. You know, 150,000 people have taken that test, $35 million in the bank. Um, chips and schools, uh, another sustainability program, the Living Building Challenge, a wonderful program. Estadama, if you're in the Middle East, Passive House. We're doing some apartments in, in, in Boston now, Passive House, uh, Green Globes, all fine programs. As a specifier, I mostly see lead. Um, because there are all these green rating systems that drive the manufacturers crazy because they all want uh, 10 or 20 or $30,000 to certify something that the manufacturer would be, uh, you know that MSDS sheet that they all have to fill out? You can't lie on that. They, you know, the, the, they come and get you for that. There was one firm that paid $155,000 for lying on their MSDS sheets. But, you know, if you need somebody else to, to prove that, they're out there too, and these are all fine organizations because we do need help sorting this out. Um, so the, um, the issue with CSI and green format, green format the PDF. Please download the free PDF. It's, it's, it's got a five-part document program, second-party, 30-party certifications, the 34 questions you really need to, to ask. Green format, the website, is not A+, plus, um, but green format, the PDF, which is really the backbone of is, and it's a wonderful document. There's a green format maintenance task team now with CSI, standards update, certifications update. Paul Bertram is president of CSI right now and the, um, we'll, we'll get to green format, uh, have to, just a second. Um, very much in support of, of life cycle assessments. The, please come to the, uh, you know, the, there's a green update, it was our last month's webinar, it's there forever on the CSI website. You know, some uh, wonderful places to go, csinet.org, the whole building design guide.org, nine million, or yeah, I think on nine million pages, 300 standards organizations. Uh, greenformat.com, uh, uh, certainly a, uh, a wonderful document. Buildinggreen.com, environmental building news. Buildingscience.com, if you're interested in, in uh, uh, wood frame construction. Uh, I bring up USG Design Studio here because they, Rick Master told me that the number one use was contractors filling out submittals. I mean, we go there because you've got a 14 foot partition. You only want it to be uh, four inches thick. Of, you know, what's the spacing of the studs or what's the STC? 
things like that. So their and their and their green documentation is exemplary. Uh, RCAT.com, 900 free specs of free spec checklist that'll turn into a short form spec or a, um, uh, an outline spec, and you know, 15 seconds later, it'll be returned to you in, in Word. Um, I am partial to that because I wrote it, but it's free. All these things are free. Uh, and then uh, we've got some stuff on our website, the, you know, green checklists and uh, green product specs, things like that. So there are places you can go. Our technical committee this year, I'm, I'm privileged to be chair. We're uh, expanding on the class. Uh, Greg Seaton is instrumental in, in hurting uh, many cats to make that work. We're working on connecting sustainability and uh, submittals, which means also BIM, property sets, and sustainability. None of what we do can be separated out. Um, somebody said to me, well, can you just put all the property sets in Division One?" I said, no more than I can put all the lead requirements in Division One. no more than I can put all the ADA requirements in Division One. So we're going to see BIM specs, we're going to see green specs, and you know, you're going to be kind of in charge of making this work. So we, we, we started as uh, specifiers, you know, they printed specs hardbound. It was the, the, the nice thing to do. I have a, a letter from 1902. The architect says, uh, a thousand brick for your building, $12. An extra copy of the spec, $12. I guess that's what it meant to, to retype it or something. But we're moving to this dynamic mode, uh, and this is Bob's house. Um, and, you know, Bob could count the studs. Bob can dim the lights. Bob can look out the window and see where to put the plants. He can do stormwater runoff. He can do normal plans, because Bob's a one-man army. But we need, as, as part of bigger teams, we need to understand how these BIM models are working and, and we know that that data is right there. So why? Because you can have BIM generated specs. If you've got an owner, um, uh, gosh, I'm actually on time. Um, the, you can have BIM generated specs. I want to, what I really want to do is grab that model and shake it and catch it. But right now there's not much falling out. And as Bob said with his spec attic, I could put it all up there at 300 feet. It just falls farther. But you know, if it isn't in the building, I don't know exactly what's what's going on. And if you're an owner and you know that, you know, uh, if you're a hotel owner and you know that that door is the biggest complaint of noise uh, in your hotel, and you've got an SDC 53 door, and that's my CAD model, and that's my BIM model, and that's my spec. And by the way, I bought 18,000 of them this year. Then that's a decision that's made, and that should live in the BIM model. If you're in the Army and you don't allow um, uh, a wood floor in bachelor officers' quarters, it's not a choice. If you're in Vermont and you don't reimburse schools for carpet, it's not a choice. So owners are going to get smarter and smarter. Um, if you need your spec, is you know a lot of pages, you can do it. If you need it shorter, you can. So, in, in concluding my part, yeah, it's risky business. We're in it together. That's what we got to make work. So, I'm going to turn it over to um, to Doug, and as we switch, how did they what version of green format are we on now? Uh, what version of green format are we on? That's a quiz. Ten people in the room should know that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there were versions. <laughs> I know that it was last posted. Correct. I have, I have something. I have early for a uh, uh, Well, download, download the new one and write the version. I don't know what you're talking about. I think it's probably a more expanded version. Yeah. Something for the number. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, no, the, the current version will say 2011 okay. when you download it. Well, first off, I'd like to thank Bob for doing my presentation. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. <laughs> uh, it's been a long day. So why don't we take a stretch break. If you all stand up, yes. I will lead us in reciting the, the, the holy four statements from the way of the specifier, all right? <laughs> and you just repeat after me. Hang it straight, <laughs> screw it tight, <laughs> beat to fit, <laughs> paint to match. <laughs> and you see it. Uh, Bob, will you pass the collection plate? <laughs> you say clear, concise, the really exciting thing about the uh, all of the practice groups is it's, it fulfills, I think, the basic vision of CSI, and that is 
for those of us who are out in the trenches to share knowledge, information, and advice about what works and what doesn't. And uh, David and I uh, like to try, we try to present practical ideas, things that people can uh, put into use in their uh, daily practice to, to simplify their lives. That's, people helped us when we were coming up through the ranks and uh, we like to pass that on and encourage as much discussion as possible and so we invite you to, to join us on that uh, endeavor. So. Architects and engineers have finally begun to understand that we're in the information business, not the drawing business. And the question then is whether a given type of information is best created and communicated in BIM, in 2D drawings, in specifications, or in schedules. What's not so clearly understood is that design teams need a person designated to plan and manage the creation, development, and communication of that information. And of course this is what both Bob and uh, Mark uh, have already told you today. And I want to tell you that we did not sit together and coordinate our, our presentations. Uh, I was as much surprised by what Mark and Bob had to say as you were, I'm sure. Uh, but it shows that these are trends that people are beginning to think about uh, throughout the industry. And so, because most projects now, uh, multidiscipline firms have always, do not always have someone to uh, assemble the various documents from those different disciplines to make a coherent, whole, coordinated package. Uh, in some firms, uh, the, the uh, engineers come in and each one drops a, a stack of paper on the, a, 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 a secretary's desk. The uh, architect comes in and puts their stuff. The ID folks come in and bring their stuff. And then a non-technical clerical person shuffles it all together, puts a table of contents on it, and goes out the door. But it's not viewed as a coherent whole. And that's one of the things that is sometimes missing. And because most projects now have construction documents that are issued in more than one work package, this uh, problem, this rather than one building set, this issue is becoming critical. So people with specific skills in preparing specifications that are coordinated between different forms of information are best prepared for this new role. Now what we're talking about, we've uh, used this word a whole lot this afternoon, and you've heard it a whole lot during the rest of this uh, convention. But let's take a minute to be wax philosophical and uh, ask ourselves, what is this information? And here's a, a working definition that, you, that I suggest to you. And how does this will play out in practical uh, life? Well, according to research by Fred Stitt, uh, an author of numerous books on working drawings and their content, and an instructor at the San Francisco Institute of Architecture, over half of the time spent on a given drawing is redrawing. While some redrawing, of course, is unavoidable, the primary source of avoidable redrawing is simply drawing ahead of what is known about the project, including decisions that have been made about products. I've performed uh, quality assurance reviews on a wide variety of project sizes and types for the last 16 years. I will tell you, it is very common to see whole drawings that are covered with imaginary fiction that has nothing to do with the project and is going to have to be extensively redrawn to have any real information in it, any meat on the bones. It's very common to see the, uh, what uh, drafters have produced that are lacking in either 
technical knowledge or knowledge about the decisions that have already been made, or both, or that the decisions haven't been made. Industry trends from BIM, from integrated project delivery and lean concepts, are all pointing to the critical importance of developing information at the right time during the project and not getting ahead of that information. Having a so where does information come from? I'll propose this, uh, this concept to you that information to be meaningful has to have structure. And in the context that I'm using it, structure can be equivalent to, or is equivalent to the CSI formats. Mere facts, mere decisions are not information. To be meaningful, data has to have an organization. CSI has been at the forefront of developing formats for different purposes so that information is usable for reasoning and for action. Structure for meaning, structure for information development, structure for information management, structure for information communication, and finally structure for information retrieval because if you can't find it, it doesn't exist. In the past, development of information was done in discrete stages with little carryover between them. When I was a, an apprentice back in the 1960s, I could remember the, uh, the bosses arguing back and forth whether or not it was worth uh, taking the effort to scrub down the uh, the floor plans for uh, schematic design to try to make them into design development drawings or whether to just throw them away and start over. And that, was, uh, and that was the basic concept, is starting over at each stage. Project information passed from the owner to the design team, to the contractor, and back to the owner, and it required starting over each time with loss of efficiency and with opportunities for meaningful information to be misunderstood or even lost in the transition. In computer terms, handoffs between uh, participants in this model are lossy. Today, we at least realize that information development needs to be a process of cumulative growth, with various entities making contributions to a single information set. Instead of starting over in construction, construction teams can utilize BIM files produced by the design team to prepare coordination and shop drawing fabrications drawings. Deliverables then become snapshots at appropriate levels of development. Realization of this goal is certainly far from complete, but recognizing it as a goal allows us to make decisions, daily decisions, about improving our production procedures to move us in the right direction. You've got to know what your target is or you won't hit it. <coughs> At present, well, in the past, it was pretty clear what information went in drawings, what information went in the specifications. It was also pretty clear the information in the drawings <coughs> did not vary a lot between firms. So for a given size project, uh, let's say a branch bank, the drawings from uh, a firm in Boston or a firm in Cincinnati where I worked or a, a firm out in uh, Arizona would probably look pretty much like the same set. The same information was there. But the, getting into BIM with the, that advent, it becomes necessary to make conscious decisions about where information will go. Uh, we are, as we are growing in BIM at my firm, we're meeting clients who go to BOMA meetings and other conventions. And we wish they'd stay at home. Oh, we just wish they'd stay at home. Because they come to us and say, give me some of that BIM. I want some of that BIM. I know, man, I'm excited. I want some of that BIM. <laughs> right. How much do you want to pay for, Mr. Owner? How much information do you want in the model? And so, now, we knew, they never asked that question when we were, we were doing paper drawings, whether it was with CAD or by hand. 
But now we have to ask that question, and we have to document it. We have to do a BIM execution plan for almost every project. We have to have an elaborate matrix that exactly explains the level of development, sometimes known as level of detail, of what's going to be in the model as opposed to what's going to be in other documents. As uh, Bob has said, there will probably always be a need for written specifications. The amount of information that can be stuffed into a model and successfully extracted and make it practical to open on a workstation and be usable is limited. Even today, a lot of contractors, when we pass own an architectural BIM file to them, will in fact strip out what they don't need because it's too much information and it becomes uh, too unwieldy to use. And so there will always be a place for written specifications. Now, for one thing, there are things that are going to be in the specifications that are not modeled. Think about Division One. Division One is all the stuff that costs money you need to have to build a building and yet it does not result in permanent improvements to real property. In other words, it don't result in bricks and mortar. So those things will have to will not be in the model. Again, the uh, project specifier must be involved in the decisions about information location so that we can continue that sound principle of CSI. Say it together. Say it once. Come on. Say it right. And say it in the right place. Okay. We all know that mantra. That's, that's written on our hearts. It is time then that we start thinking about producing specifications with word processing software and begin to utilize database software so that we can report, generate reports, structured queries, using different purposes. Again, just what Bob said, stealing all of my thunder in advance. Ideally, the owner's requirements to the uh, design team would be communicated using uniform organization. And in fact, many uh, firms do that to for RFPs. Uh, I myself wrote a set of master specifications for uh, a Federal Express company for lease build suit projects so that they could get competitive pricing from competing developers. Um, then the uh, design team would take that same set of, imp of information, again in uniformat, and start fleshing it out and al aligning the functional objects or the functional elements in the preliminary project description with the objects in BIM. Uh, as the design progresses through the DD phase, additional information and decisions would be fed into this database. You, plug, you can put hyperlinks uh, to websites, you can put information in there, uh, even whole catalog pages to record that, the information and help record why certain decisions were made. If anyone ever had the struggle a year and a half, two years later when a contractor wants to bring in a substitution and the guy that picked the original product is no longer with the firm and nobody knows why it was selected and all of a sudden you have to say well is this equal does it really do what it wants to do we need to record those decisions and there are ways to do that now those the some of that information might not be in the deliverable, the pro preliminary project description that goes to the owner for formal approvals and other purposes. But that information needs to be somewhere, be tracked and be recorded. As that information is developed, we could uniform that because it is an analytical classification system, it's hierarchical. That means that you can drill down from one layer to another and you get down to the part where it's an individual component of the system or assembly 
that is being described as a functional element as a whole, and those components can be assigned master format numbers, and that becomes the granularity, that becomes the place where it becomes uh, translatable into master format. So then that information can be resorted at the appropriate time to prepare the legal documents, contract documents, known <laughs> as construction specifications, organized by uniformat. During construction, the contractor, again as Bob has already said, can add information to that data set and say, okay, of these three uh, acceptable forms of silicone or brands of silicone sealant, my subcontractor used this one. Of the, uh, of the four different curtain wall manufacturers, we use products of that manufacturer and record that information. At the end of the construction, then it should be theoretically, well, it's impossible to resort that information then back into Uniformat for use in facilities management because nothing glazes over the eyes of an owner like a book of specs. You can't read it. It, does, it doesn't have a start, stop, and finish. But I, over the years, I started using the uh, concept of the preliminary project description organized with Uniformat about 20 years ago. It was first published in the CSI Manual of Practice in 1989, and dumb me, I thought, hey, that sounds like a good idea, I'm going to start doing it. And over the years, I've collected a, a number of uh, great compliments from my owners who read the document and understand it, because it proceeds in an intuitive and logical manner. It starts with the substructure, goes to the superstructure shell, to the interiors, to the services that feed the building, and so forth. And so there is a great use or a, a great benefit for using the Uniformat uh, organization for facilities management. But again, if we think about it, it's all the same data, but we're going to structure it to create different forms of information. So, I want to say it is a great privilege to see so many people excited and interested in specifications. Uh, this is a really important task. Too many architects and engineers view it as a second level effort. In the words of Andrew Civitello, the attorney who wrote the Contractor's Guide to Change Orders. I cheated, I read the book. Looked at what they, looked at the cards on the, on the uh, hands of the player on the other side of the table. Was a mirror. So we need to be thinking about that. And the, the, uh, the future of the specifier is that having to make product decisions earlier, as Mark has said, a lot of the folks who are drawing those nifty walls and 3D stuff don't know what those walls should be. That's our job. That's the job of the specifiers that we're going to help train in the next few years. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to, uh, to Bob and to Mark and to Lewis for, uh, for those comments. We, we really hope that the discussion today has um, stimulated your thinking. Maybe you heard some new ideas, maybe you heard some old ideas, maybe you have some better ideas. And we'd encourage you all to uh, uh, those that haven't participated in a practice group to get involved with the practice group. And the way to do that is to go on to uh, csinet.org. Uh, there you will find on the right hand, uh, left hand side, um, you can click on practice groups. And there you can see a listing of all of the current practice groups that we have. And you'll notice there's two additional that you didn't hear from today. One on contract administration and another on uh, product representation. We try to have practice groups that uh, are of interest to all the core membership categories within the Institute. And if you have another potential practice group that you'd like to see formed, uh, just get in touch with CSI. And if you uh, want to 
uh, be that first volunteer leader to get one going. Uh, they'll make all the arrangements to set up the webinars for you and set up a schedule and a time and get the word out to the other members of CSI. Uh, 